Thanks for clicking. Before we get started, I just want to talk about a couple things. If you're crossing oceans on a little boat, you are literally at the interface of two fluids, the ocean and the atmosphere, that are incredibly complex and dynamic and which carry and impart forces that are really very difficult to comprehend. You are completely at the mercy of the elements. And that's not something I think you truly appreciate until you get offshore. If you can grasp how to receive and interpret weather data, you are gonna have a much, much better time than a fancier boat could give you, fancier piece of gear can give you, or even a more beautiful destination. It is all about the weather. Also, I wanted to talk about the affiliate program that I'll announce at the end of this video. I just want to make it clear, this is not a sponsored video. In fact, I didn't even know the affiliate program was available from this company when I was doing my reviews. So just keep that in mind. This is not biased in any way. This is what I really use and this is what I really think. So Nick, why is it that the weather doesn't match what I see on my little screen? Well, I'm gonna tell you this right off the bat. There is no perfect computer model. In fact, a professional forecaster will use even a dozen computer models to make a forecast. So what does it really take to make a good forecast on board? Three things. You missing any of these and you're not gonna forecast very well. Number one, you need data. You need models and a variety of models. Number two, you need some sort of knowledge or education. You need to know what to look for, what's important and what isn't. And then lastly, you need experience. You need time to get into this, watch the weather pattern, see how things evolve. If you're missing any of those three, you're not gonna be able to make a good forecast. So today we're gonna to focus on data. We're gonna talk about which apps do the best job, which apps give you the best variety of information, and then we're gonna to talk to a modeler. We're gonna to talk to somebody who actually puts the forecast models together. It's gonna to be pretty cool. All right, first of all, there are basically two types of computer models available to sailors. I'm not talking about hydrostatic versus non-hydrostatic, nested grid, global array, spectral models. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about free data and data you gotta pay for. Now the data that most of the free weather forecasting apps use is free data. I mean, they're not gonna pay for the data and just give it to you for free by showing you a little advertisement for socks or dishwashing soap. These are models like the MRF. The ECMWF is mostly free to private users. The NAM, you're gonna see the same data used from one app to another to another. So what's the difference? It's just the computer display. Whether you like this color or that color, this menu system or that menu system. These models can be completely adequate. The data that is tailored specifically to marine use, computer models that have been dialed in, if you will, for those of us right at the ocean atmosphere interface, that data costs something. Proprietary models can sometimes have a big advantage over the free stuff. Not always. That's why we need to have a variety of information to look at. Uh, so within that context, what are my main criteria for the best applications to use for forecasting for a little boat? It's gotta have good data, and it's gotta have a relatively easy to understand and manage interface. So, I know that was a really long preamble, so let's get into it. Let's talk about some apps that are pretty much just junk, barely worth your time, definitely not a download. And then we'll talk about a couple of applications that I think you should consider. They're what I use. Oh, time out, little change of plans. I have reviewed at least a dozen apps, and some of this, some of these are just absolute garbage. But instead of wasting your time telling you about apps that aren't worth your time, 
why don't we stick with what is worth your time, and that is apps that are worth your time. <laughs> <laughs> now, how to divide things up. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna divide the apps up into two categories. Number one, apps and sites that require high bandwidth, high speed internet. You gotta have the data to get these apps and sites working. The other category will be apps that can be used with a slow satellite connection, something like an Iridium Go. We're also gonna break these down into free and paid apps. And because I'm a big fan of free, let's start there. Now, in terms of free apps that require high bandwidth, there are really just two games in town. I believe you pronounce it Ventuski, Ventuski, and Windy. These are 100% free apps, but they were built for general use, not for sailing specifically. So there's no routing and the ocean data is really quite rudimentary. Venchuski was developed by a Czech company. It's a fairly lightweight application with various satellite and radar layers available. They really have only two forecast models available, the MRF and the ICON model. What they do have going for them though is an easy and intuitive way of looking at winds in different levels of the atmosphere quickly and easily. And we can step out a few days or check out the global pattern quite easily. The heavy hitter in terms of free apps, and it's also a website, is windy.com. I just love this app, I love their website, and it's really become a benchmark for all others. It has a very intuitive and easy to use interface that works pretty well with just a few errors here and there. Just about any real-time data is available from satellite to winds to radar to tides. They've even got a network of live cameras. Aside from the current winds, we don't really seem to have any buoy information. That may change. When it comes to forecast models, Windy is somewhat limited. I mean, it is free data. We've got the GFS and the ECMWF models available globally, and then the NAM model for North America. All the usual parameters are available, and we can select upper level winds all the way out through the forecast period. What Windy doesn't have is a lightweight app for GRIB files. So, unless you have high-speed internet, Windy is no good for offshore work. But close to land with a good internet signal, Windy's great, and it's free. Until Elon Musk gets his Starlink array up and running, and that's really gonna change things in a major way here in the next couple of years, if you need to access weather data, at least offshore, that means getting GRIB data. A GRIB file is a type of file that delivers gridded data for use on a map. The files are really just tiny and can be sent via email or in small download files appropriate for the slow speeds of most satellite data connections. There are a handful of apps that can accomplish this task. But it comes down to two companies that offer the features that offshore sailors need. And those are Predict Wind and Weather 4D. Both are quite capable of delivering weather data and routing information, and both are quite usable via high-speed internet and offshore via satellite phone. As you'll see, I actually use both. Predict Wind is a New Zealand company. They have divided their offering actually into two applications, Predict Wind and Predict Wind Offshore. As a package, even though they're a bit expensive for the full offshore deal, I feel they offer the best paid solution for offshore sailors. Today we're gonna focus on the Predict Wind Offshore app, which is really what distinguishes them from a lot of the free stuff you find online. I don't want to make this sound like an infomercial, but I am a fan of the company and their products. And keep in mind, I do use Predict Wind Offshore, but I also use Weather 4D. They actually complement each other fairly well. But let's take them one by one. What I love about Predict Wind is the simplicity. You set your departure and your destination, 
and you then select the products that you want to download. And that's just about it. So let's plan a quick little trip from, say, the Chesapeake down to Puerto Rico. We won't have our high resolution gribs enabled for this because we're offshore. We can check our grib preferences. We'll download all the models and the interval is gonna be six hours out five days. Now offshore, 50 to 100 kilometers resolution sounds pretty coarse, but it's actually pretty good for a trip like this. We'll leave it at 50. We don't need to see anything but the wind, the rain, and the waves and optimize for the fastest time. Now you can see the download size is 1.1 megabytes. That would probably take about an hour to an hour and a half to download offshore. So what we're gonna do, we'll go back to our offshore grid preferences, change that to 100 kilometer grid resolution and we'll get the data every 12 hours. We're also gonna turn off the cape and now we've got a file size of 152.6. All right, now that we've got the weather route downloaded, that usually takes a little bit longer. We'll switch over to the map view. We've got four models, four sets of model data. We got the PWG, the PWE, the GFS, and the ECMWF. This really gives us a nice array of information. The PWG and the PWE are both the predict wind proprietary models based off of the GFS and the ECMWF. Let's go back to the tables here and we'll see how clustered the data is. And it does look like the models are in pretty good agreement for this trip. And it looks like the computer's predicting between six and a half and seven and a half days. Let's look at some other parameters. So based on this data, looks like we'll need to take it easy, getting out of port, maybe wait for this little front or upper level low to go by. And then we'll see some smooth sailing with just some afternoon convection here and there. We can actually get other data offshore as well. The GM DSS forecasts are kind of like your National Weather Service forecasts. Also, you can download satellite pictures from Predict Wind offshore, both in color and in black and white. With a higher speed internet connection, we can get other data too. Once you've upgraded to the standard or professional versions of Predict Wind, those data packages, whole new world opens up to you. You've got sea surface data and currents, along with the high resolution forecast models, which we'll get into here in a second. But they run one and eight kilometer grids for specific areas, and that can give you an advantage. Uh, the thing about these files is they're pretty big, so you're not gonna be using them offshore unless you've got a stabilized satellite antenna. But here's the eight kilometer data, and you can see that it's got much finer resolution, especially close to coastal areas where there's probably topographic effects. If we take you a little bit further north, we'll check out some of the one kilometer data. This is the Straits of Juan de Fuca between uh, Vancouver Island and the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. And you can see how much variability there is in wind speed and that is borne out frequently with strong winds through the Straits. The ocean currents are also a big benefit to the professional data package. Now we turn our attention towards the other heavy hitter in this space and that's Weather 4D. We have got a lot more diversity in terms of model data. We've got the Arpege, the Coamps model, the GEM, the NAM, the WF, WAM. We've got several more models available, but the download sizes for these files are pretty big, making them quasi impractical for downloading offshore. So yes, you do have more data available than predict wind, but the question is, can you download it in less than two or three days?
I really like the interface of Weather 4D. It's a little bit more modern than Predict Wind. You can see a little cursor as you drag it around. You can sample some of the localized conditions for that spot. And we can also animate by dragging our finger left and right. That takes us through time. One thing you'll also notice with the split screen is that we can compare two models side by side for the same time. You can see on the left we've got the NAM 12Z and on the right the GFS. So comparisons are easy. But as usual with software, as you add features, you add complexity. The menu system for both sides of the screen is separate. So if you want to take one thing off one side, you got to go over and take it off the other as well. But overall, it's pretty easy to see some basic things like cloud cover and cape and wind speed as well as precipitation. No precip on this map quite yet. Now, Weather 4D does have a routing feature. I just have never used it. It's an upgraded cost, and I gotta tell you, what Predict Wind does for me is perfectly adequate. So if there's anybody out there that's got some feedback about using the Weather 4D routing software, please get back to us in the comments and share. So I use both Predict Wind and Weather 4D, and each have their strengths. Predict Wind is much more utilitarian with a better variety of model data. Weather 4D has perhaps a more shiny interface and it costs a lot less than Predict Wind. I also really like the two panel layout of Weather 4D, but with Predict Wind I can compare four routing options based on four different models all at once. Weather 4D does have more government models available over Gribfile, but in practice it would be impossible to download them all over a satellite connection. The answer, of course, is to use both. But if I had to use just one, it would be Predict Wind. If you're interested in purchasing Predict Wind, it would be great if you could do so through the affiliate program link in the description as we get a little kickback. Some of you may know that before we took off sailing, I was a TV weatherman. What you may not know is that uh, I actually have some cred. I have a master's in atmospheric and oceanic sciences from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I've forecasted for agricultural and transportation interests many hours on the telephone with then Major League Baseball Commissioner Bud Selig. Should we call the game? Should we do a rain delay? I just want to make it clear I have forecasted in situations that are more than just uh, hey what should I wear tomorrow. It's actually no surprise given the complexity of what we're trying to accomplish with a computer model and forecasting that the best interfaces have also been designed by sailors. They know what they need, they know what you need. In doing my research for this video, I reached out to Dr. Jack Catsby of Predict Wind. He is the project lead and one of the modelers there. I wanted to get his take on some of the common questions surrounding forecast models. Leads, and as I was going through your, uh, your CV, I was immediately intimidated, but at least I knew that we went to the same graduate school there at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Yeah, that was, that's right, although at different times. I didn't specialize in numerical modeling. I was kind of like a synoptic dynamic guy. I just wanted to learn how to forecast. Actually, that's the same as me. I was doing dynamics, synoptic dynamics when I was at uh, Madison at the time, and then eventually moved into numerical modeling and aspects and diagnostics of that. And then when I moved to Australia, I got into regional climate modeling as well as forecasting. And then John Bilka came around and said, hey, I'm doing the America's Cup in Auckland, and <clears throat> can you actually help me provide some weather forecasts for the sailboat? And I said, sure, because I like sailing, I like forecasting, and I like the America's Cup, so it was sort of like a marriage of all, <laughs> all these <laughs> Fantastic. And so how, how did you get involved with Predict Wind? Well, actually, the system we developed for forecasting for the uh, America's Cup, the Lingy team, um, at the end of that, John said, hey, 
this is a really great tool. We should use this tool for other people to, you know, as well. And I said, that sounds like a great idea. Um, so it really is an offshoot of what we developed during the America's Cup. So it's the age old question. I probably get it every time there's a severe weather event forecast. Which model is best? Yeah, of course it's predict wind. <laughs> I can always say predict wind is always best, but <laughs> um, you know, again, it it's, it it depends. There's no model that's always going to be best just because uh, the variations of the way the models are formulated and the way the initial conditions are generated and the way, yeah, the grids are set up. So it it. Um, there isn't any direct answer. You know, that's why you have to look at all of them and look at all the possibilities so that, and make a decision of usually on average, you know, the average of all forecasts or short term period or the median, if you wish, is the one that's probably going to be most likely statistically. But any given day, you know, any model could be right. So right. it's, it's, that's, you know, you sort of get into this question of probabilities, and that's all the whole idea of why they have ensembles is you're trying to see out as many models as you can and then try to figure out which one is going to be the best one. <laughs> right, and that's right. Where, where, where computers can't actually to answer that question because that's where humans come in <laughs> and the mm -hmm. individual has a decision. Right. The models, the different models can give us a range of potential outcomes. So we can kind of define the boundaries of possible outcomes. But then sometimes that fan is really wide and sometimes it's very narrow. It just gives us an idea yep. of forecast confidence. Yeah, exactly. What particular processes within a model lead to a, a incorrect uh, forecast uh, over time, what are the what are the particular nonlinearities that screw things up? Well, probably the, for for short term forecasting, the key thing is actually getting that best initial state. Uh, you know, if you don't have a good initial point starting point, then your forecast is likely not to be as accurate as is if you had a very detailed, accurate one. So that's why you know getting that initial state is very important. Once you get the initial state as good as you can, then the model resolution is very important. So the more resolution you have, the, you know, obviously more likelihood you can capture the right processes and get better forecasts. And plus it's going to be more detailed forecasts, which is usually what people want anyway. So, Are your models non-hydrostatic? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know if people know what non-hydrostatic means, but I mean, it, 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 it's a formulation that handles subgrid scale, well, small scale processes in the model more accurately, basically. So a numerical formulation, mm -hmm. um, it's tricky because sound waves are actually non-hydrostatic. So, but you don't really want to forecast sound waves because <laughs> <laughs> that makes it a little difficult. So you have to formulate equations slightly tricky or to filter out the sound waves, but keep the things that you really want, like when air goes over a mountain, you know, we're into a thunderstorm where it's going, you know, horizontally, and then it gets up in the updraft and it goes very quickly upward. There's things going on there that you, the normal hydrostatic equations ignore. And then I know it says, okay, we actually know that that vertical velocity is changing rapidly. So we want to make sure we include that in the equations when we do the forecast. So it's a more accurate, I mean, it, 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 most studies show that it does help, but it's not a game changer necessarily. I mean, mm -hmm. it's more of a detailed type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's also something that can run away from you. Is that right? Well, it depends on how you formulate it, but yeah, it it does make things more volatile. <laughs> the equation <laughs> is a little more volatile because you're including more processes that yeah, you can't get carried away if you're not careful. But that's where it comes down to when you design the model. You have to design the model to be, you want it to be obviously accurate, but you also want it to be stable so it doesn't blow up. So, right. you know, go off the rails. Uh, you can have a, I don't know, a, even a 15, 20 knot variation between what's at the surface and at the top of the mast even, yeah. or a little bit yeah. further up. So how that momentum is mixed to the surface, I would think you would have to have those those adiabatic processes like really, really dialed in. But again, that's just a layman 
sort of. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it, and it, well, it's interesting. That's one of the parameterizations that you have in the model because the actual, what's going on between the surface and the lower part of the atmosphere and up, you know, a kilometer or two up as well is there's lots of small scale uh, eddies, as they're called, or mixing going on. They're very small scales. So again, there's not what the model can actually resolve or actually simulate. But you know they're very important, as you say, the wind variations and how the what's going on on the surface affects what's going on higher up, and vice versa. So you have to parameterize them. There's a you know those again based on observations. You see what the observations show and and how that reacts, and then you put that into the model. And generally, that does pretty well. <laughs> well, I mean, the atmosphere is just it's clearly it just blows me away that we can even forecast for 72 hours. I'm I know a little bit about this stuff, and I'm just amazed we get it right as much as we do. But then you involve the ocean surface, and you look at the friction coefficients between a two-meter sea and a four-meter sea, and the, the differences you're going to get. Because remember, you're talking about wind either blowing on a relatively smooth surface or a very, very rough surface. And yep. the actual wind speeds can be radically altered by that. So I've just long been fascinated by the the dynamics at the boundary. Do you guys have uh, specific parameterizations for your models that are different than like the Navy models or have you guys been working on that? Um, well, I mean, the basic parameterizations there are different variations of it, um, how you actually do that. And we have different schemes in our model to, to try different, you know, to keep on making it better, basically. Um, it's basically assuming that the with a certain wind speed, you have a certain number of waves, and that the size of the waves then influence how much friction there is at the surface, which then will be transported up and down. Um, now, over the ocean, it's a little bit easier because the ocean is fairly uniform. I mean, it's flat for one thing, generally, except for the waves, <laughs> but <laughs> are pretty close to being flat. Then it gets more complicated when you get over land, where you have vegetation and buildings and mountains. And mountains. Like that. <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit simpler over the ocean, but yeah, there are a little different formulations, and each model does it a little bit differently. And we're always working on trying to make it better. Well, everybody is. Everybody's trying to make things better in their model. What are nested grids, and what's the difference between the 8K stuff that I, you guys give that out for free, don't you, and the 1K stuff in the pro version? It's a computational trick, basically, to get the highest resolution over the area of interest, which you can't afford to do everywhere. So you try to focus your resources, computational resources, and highest or finest grid in the area of interest. And that's where you do this nesting, where you change the resolution, either through step changes or through gradations like the stretch grid, where you can actually vary the gradually change the resolution is get to the fine resolution area. So that is the whole idea of nesting. Basically, the way we run it, or the way the particular wind runs, you again, the information flows from the coarser resolution into the finer resolution, the eight kilometer, which is, is a fairly larger domain of, of interest. And then the one kilometer is a much smaller region within the eight kilometer, then feeds from the eight kilometer into the one kilometer. And they're all one way nesting, so that all the information goes from the coarser resolution to the finer one. I mean, some People do two-way nesting where the information then can feed back to the course of resolution, but then you have to run the model at the same time. This way, you can run them sequentially. Oh, that's actually that's the way I assumed you guys were doing them. So the nested grids aren't feeding back into the larger grid. No. And is is anybody doing that now? I is uh, ECMWF now doing that? Well, they only run global one resolution. Um, <clears throat> MPAS, which is a new version of the WARF model, has a stretch grid, I think, uh, which and they also, even the WARF model, I think, has nested grids that can feed back so that, you know, if you run the high resolution, the averaging of the one the high resolution influences the course of resolution grid and, you know, and so on. So that but again, they're running it all have to be run concurrently. So, that, and it means that you're always running all the models at the same time still, um, because that's the way the models run. <laughs> so I wonder, do they must have to then apply smoothing in some cases, right? Because they could get convective feedback, right? From these teeny tiny little grids. 
Yeah. Well, when you go from one resolution to another, you have to do smoothing. Yeah. 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 Or uh, averaging anyway of some sort. How far out can we trust a forecast? Well, uh, yeah. How long is a piece of string, as they say? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it depends on what you mean by trust, I guess. Um, if you really want to know the detailed forecast, I mean, one to two day forecast for detailed winds over a region. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, you know, you get start getting on beyond that. I mean, unless it's a really steady wind, but if there's a lot of variability or changes in fronts and synoptic systems, you know, low pressures and high pressures, that the accuracy, you know, any small air in that will make a, could make a potential, you know, air in your wind forecast in a small region. So, but generally, I mean, forecasting fronts and lows and highs and the winds associated with them are generally pretty good out to, say, 10 days. Um, but you're not predicting a given event at a given time because of uncertainty of where those weather systems are going to be you know you can't predict any given event at a given time even that as I say after 10 days the likelihood of being able to predict when the next front wind shift is coming through you know is pretty small just because right. the timing is going to be you may know you may come in you know a day early or two days early or two days later but it, you know the model will probably say it's coming but it the actual when it's going to occur is, you know, pretty uncertain, shall we say. It can be really helpful, though, to even discern as a as a traveler by boat to discern between an active pattern and mm. a stable inactive pattern. So, yeah, you're totally right. I don't know. The front arrives a week from Tuesday or a week from Thursday. I don't know. But I do know that I see four fronts coming. And yep. maybe we're 48 hours off on each, but does that matter for planning purposes? Depends on what you need the data for, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it depends. On, yeah, again, it depends on your expectations a little bit of what you expect. I mean, you don't expect it to be exactly right, but you expect it to say, okay, they're predicting A front to come through. Well, okay, well, sometime in that period, so we'll plan for that. And not exactly timing, but exactly, you know, expect it to happen at some point around that time period. I really do think that the model's pretty darn good. You know, a lot of times I can see it run away here and there, but it, it's good stuff, and yeah. especially the delivery Working method. On that, I mean, there's always, as I say, I, I know there's a few things that occasion the model does get carried away with a little bit, and I think I know why. And I'm mm. going to talk to to John a little bit about that and try to figure out ways to run the model and try to get a little better results. Yeah. Always trying. To for you guys <laughs> oh we really appreciate it we need it out there i always say this the, the the make or break between a good cruise and a bad cruise isn't the size of your water maker and it's not the size of your solar panels the make or break is whether or not you can get out and weather windows that don't ups, upset you and mm -hmm. uh you know you can have a fantastic day or a really really awful day and it has nothing to do with the design of your boat it has to do with yep. the fact that you went out on the wrong day um yeah so I stress that to people all the time, that forecasting, understanding how to read data and interpret it for your own needs is critical to exactly. the fun factor. I really, really appreciate your time and, and, and okay. helping me uh, understand and helping the viewers understand. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell us about predict when and the models, uh, anything that will help us do a better job in picking those right windows? Well, uh, you yeah, know, we touched on this about looking at the range of models. I mean, as I say, each model will have its strengths and weaknesses. And one advantage of pretty wind, obviously, is it's, it does go down to one kilometer, so it can capture some of the local effects, especially near the coast, where those wind variations are affected by the terrain. And the detail of the terrain is very important, and so the high resolution is going to give you a much better depiction of those local effects. Um, so, yeah, um, and, and again, to keep in mind that, you know, no forecast is going to be best all the time, and you have to look at the range of them. I mean, it's just like the last time in the America's Cup in Valencia, the last official one, not the dog race, but the, <laughs> the last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we had the races there, that last race against Team New Zealand, I mean, um, 
you know, there was a wind shift just at the end of the race, the last race that came from the north. You know, the most of the models didn't predict it, but there were, when you looked at a range of models and ensemble, there were a few models that actually hinted that there was a, a wind from the north coming down the coastline. Um, so again, you know, when you're out sailing, you know, not that you're professionally racing like America's Cup boats, but I mean, if you're out racing and you look at the range of models, and one model says something that's different than the other. So at least you have it in your mind to to be careful, but to expect that, you know, not that it's going to occur, but that it might might occur. And so, that you know, you're not surprised by it, I guess. The range of possible outcomes. Yes. Yeah. I hope you picked up some interesting tips and hints and maybe some understandings about how the weather works and weather forecast models work. If you've got more questions about all this stuff, please, please leave a comment or a question down in the comments section, and that could be a topic for a future video. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll check you next week.